Parkway Speaker Series. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it very much. My name is Pat Goodwin. I'm a Riverscape board member. Um, and tonight we have Dr. Alan Shotwell, who will be speaking. Uh, he's professor and interim dean at Ivy Tech Community College. He has a PhD in the history and philosophy of science from Indiana University and has written and presented on numerous historical subjects, including Vigo County history. Currently, he's working on a project about Terre Haute and the Wabash River between the Civil War and World War I. Before I turn it over to him, one other thing I would just like to make sure that I don't forget to say is that the, the Waterways exhibit, the Smithsonian exhibit, is going on six days a week over at what used to be West Terre Haute Elementary is now the School Corporation Administration Building. And that's weekdays 10 to 4 and Saturday 11, uh, 12 to 3. I'm looking at my expert back there. And Sunday 12 to 3. Right, so the only day that it's not open is today. Uh, but 10 to 4, weekdays, noon to 3. So make sure you stop by there and check that out. And without further ado, Thank you. Dr. Shotwell. Uh, no, yeah, I think I need to have a microphone. Thank yep. you. Oh, that's yours. <laughs> Thank you so much for the introduction. I do want to say go see that exhibit because it's pretty cool. I got to see it last weekend. It's, it's worth the trip. Right. Okay, well, let's get rolling since we're a little behind. Uh, in 1865, Terre Haute businessman Uriah Shoemaker bought a surplus boat from the U.S. Army for $9,000 and put it to work transporting goods and passengers on the Wabash River. The Romeo was 150 feet long and 32 feet abeam. She could run 10 miles an hour upstream or down, and during the war had seen enough action to sport holes from musket balls in their bulkheads and the cabin. Shoemaker used the Romeo to transport cargo to destinations both north and south of the city. Throughout the spring and summer of 1867, the Romeo made trips every two or three days from a dock just north of the Main Street or Wabash Avenue Bridge, which in this picture is right there. And this is the Main Street Bridge. And this is the Romeo. Shoemaker advertised his steamboat's departure in the local newspaper and took aboard whatever and whoever would pay. Flour, pork, grain, and people. At least three different church Sunday schools used the Romeo for picnic excursions in the summer of 1867. The United States Congressman General H.D. Washburn took the Romeo to his Clinton home, and the cargo of one trip downriver to Evansville included tobacco, eggs, green hides, and a money package, whatever that is. The Romeo continued its trips for the next two years, trapping south to York and Hudsonville, as well as north to Clinton, Perrysville, and Covington. And in the, but in the spring of 1868, she hit a snag just south of Terre Haute and took on water with a cargo of pork. But she was easily landed on the shore nearby and back in business in a matter of days. Sometime in 1869, the Romeo ceased operations in Terre Haute when Shoemaker sold her to a new owner in Evansville, who used her on the Ohio River. The Romeo was not Shoemaker's first riverboat venture, but it was, in many ways, a sign of the dawning of a golden age of steamboat traffic on the Wabash River. Between the end of the Civil War and the beginning of the 20th century, more than 50 steamboats operating on the Wabash and associated with Terre Haute can be identified. These boats hauled cargo exceeding a million dollars a year and were operated by dozens of river captains, pilots, and engineers, and hundreds of riverboat crew members. This era was actually a rebirth of a river economy that first began in the early years of the 19th century. The steamboat business on the Mississippi and the Ohio rivers peaked in the 1830s, quickly extending into the tributaries, including the Wabash River. The first steamboat appeared in Terre Haute in 1822, and by 1831, between 50 and 60 steamboats plied the waters of the Wabash alongside untold numbers of flatboats constructed locally, loaded with corn or pork, and floated downstream with the current. But this initial phase was short-lived. In 1832, the state of Indiana broke ground on the Wabash and Erie Canal, which would supplant the Wabash River traffic. And even more importantly, Andrew Jackson vetoed the bill, fund bill funding maintenance of the Wabash River 
just two years later. Large-scale traffic, uh, large-scale river traffic relies on human intervention to be commercially viable. To navigate a river, large boats require water of a certain depth, free of, of obstructions. But the natural water levels of rivers are seasonal, and they are filled with recur reoccurring obstructions. Through the natural rhythms of the current, sand from the river bottom accumulates in places to form bars. The riverbed is constantly shifting, causing narrow channels with fast-moving water, and also wide, shallow areas and sharp bends. And then logs, whole trees, and other snags are swept into the river by floods or fall into the river from the undercutting of banks by the river itself or by agriculture. And there they lurk, invisible, under the surface, waiting to tear a hole in the hull of a passing ship. The natural changes in depths of the rivers as they pass through lands of various uh, elevations, sorry, also cause fast drops over waterfalls that are not navigable by large boats and dangerous to pretty much every boat. But in the 19th century, overcoming these obstacles in the western rivers of the United States was the responsibility of the Army Corps of Engineers, funded by the federal government. The engineers built dams and locks and cleared obstructions in the Ohio, the Mississippi, and other western rivers throughout the 19th century, but not the Wabash, which received no federal funds and was not improved as a navigable waterway by the engineers until after the Civil War. Canal construction made matters worse for the Wabash, since the canal used water from the river and extensions were built out into the path of the river to get it in. Given its, given its focus on the canal, the state of Indiana saw no reason to take up the cost of river maintenance that was vetoed by the federal government. And I just, if you don't mind me skipping a bit back a second, uh, when you look at the map here, this red line is the canal, the blue line is the river, and I think this is really striking to see that the river and the canal are effectively the same route, at least until you get to Terre Haute. So maintaining the Wabash River as a navigable waterway when you had the canal just really made no sense. Um, so I'll just get back here. The only private investment in the river's navigability before uh, the Civil War was in the 1850s when the Wabash Navigational Company built a lock at the Grand Rapids, just north of modern-day Mount Carmel, Illinois. But by the late 1860s, the Grand Lop, Rapids lock had fallen into disrepair, and the Wabash Navigation Company had fallen into near bankruptcy. The problem was that maintaining the lock cost money, but the fees collected by the company suffered from competition by the railroad and from the changing geography of commerce wrought by the Civil War. So in the 1860s, the Wabash uh, Navigation Company Board of Directors hit upon a plan to save the company, sell the lock and the land around it to the federal government. The possibility of federal do dollars being used to buy the lock and improve the river's navigation became a reality in 1871 when Senator Oliver Morton proposed funding an improvement project on the Wabash to Congress. The main priorities identified the bill, by the bill that ultimately passed into law were a survey of the river by the Army Corps of Engineers to establish what needed to be done and to, to make it navigable, and the purchase of the lock from the Wabash Navigation Company. A superficial report of the state of the river was submitted by the Army Engineers in 1871, and a more complete survey was done in 1872. The lock and surrounding land weren't purchased until late in 1874, after three years of negotiations over the price. But between 1871 and 1892, Congress continued to fund a variety of maintenance projects on the Wabash River to be performed by the Army engineers. The amount allocated, allocated varied by year, but the annual allocation was usually about $50,000. In 1881, backed by letters of support, written by both Herman Holman and William Riley McKean, Indiana Senator Daniel Voorhees proposed a new funding formula designed to increase the attention paid to the river around Terre Haute. Voorhees' plan was to divide the engineer's work on the Wabash into two sections, one above and one below Vincennes. 
The idea was to double the amount of money spent on the river each year, allocating $50,000 apiece to the upper and the lower Wabash River, and thereby providing for much additional work on its northern stretch, including Terre Haute. Unfortunately for Voorhees, the bill that actually passed divided the $50,000 into two $25,000 allocations, one to the northern Wabash and one to the south. And from that point onwards, the amount of money allocated annually to the Wabash River above Vincennes was conspicuously smaller than the amount allocated to the river below. In most years, the upper Wabash received about $5,000, while the lower Wabash often exceeded $20,000 and sometimes reached $60,000. Congressional funding for the Wabash River took an even bigger hit in 1883, when the Wabash appropriation was strongly objected to by John White, Senator from Kentucky. This is your moment to boo, by the way. So this is the evil person. Right. White complained about the way the Congress had been funding improvements for trout streams all across the country. And then he made tonight remarks about the artisan well in Terre Haute, asking Voorhees if it was the well that supplied water to the Wabash. That well and the sulfur smell that emanated from it was a favorite source of humor for people who wanted to poke fun at Terre Haute in the late 19th century. In 1870, an Indianapolis reporter named Hathaway claimed Terre Haute's two main points of interest were the artisan bathhouse and the theater comique. Both places were hard to take, he said, because one of them smelled of brimstone and the proprietors of the other one were frequently drunk on it. <laughs> he added that the city once had a courthouse, but they had torn it down in favor of a Limburger cheese factory. It was worth noting that the reporter was told that if he ever set foot in Terre Haute again, he would be wabashed or thrown into the river. Voorhees right. himself chose to not to hear the remark from the gentleman from Kentucky, probably to avoid an outright conf uh, confrontation, but no money was allocated to maintaining the Wabash River at all for the next three years. In 1866, no money was allocated for the upper Wabash, but the lower Wabash received $60,000. Wabash River appropriations ceased altogether after 1892. But despite these setbacks, in 1881, federal snag boats appeared on the river by Terre Haute and were greeted by, with much enthusiasm by city residents. The 1882 Army Engineers Report described commissioning the building of two snag boats for use on the Wabash River, one was actually sent to the White River instead, but the other, the Oseo, moved, removed snags along the Wabash from 1883 to 1889 when it was no longer serviceable and decommissioned. In 1889, the Army engineers hired a Terre Haute steamer, the Ida Lee, and outfitted her to act as a snag boat. And in 1892, the Richard Ford, another snag boat owned by the engineers, moved, removed snags on the Wabash. Snag removal and dredging was never ending, essentially having to start over again after every season when the spring rain and annual erosion dumped more trees and soil into the river. In 1882, for example, engineers removed 51 trees and 209 snags using the Oseo and reported that small team steamers could now travel from Terre Haute to Vincennes in all seasons. In 1892, 688 snags, weighing a total of 3,870 tons, were removed above Vincennes alone, but by 1896 the engineers reported that the snags above Vincennes had so clogged the river that, the, that navigation was only possible during high water. The always unfinished snag work, coupled with the minimal re resources invested in the river maintenance above Vincennes after 1881, meant the navigability of the Wabash River was often variable and subject to numerous constraints. And although there were occasional efforts to stir Congress to provide more funding, they were not successful. Some private efforts were made to improve the Wabash's navigability, but the Wabash River maintenance, uh, really maintenance of the Wabash River for navigation reasons essentially ended around 1893. But the volume of commercial traffic on the river was not completely synchronized with its maintenance efforts. And even the largest steamers on the Wabash could navigate relatively shallow water. There were, in fact, a host of steamboats of a large size operating on the Wabash River. The size of the steamers on the Wabash after the Civil War ranged from the largest, which were about 125 feet long, 
and 250 tons in displacement to a smaller size of around 50 tons and some even smaller still. Counting Shoemaker's Romeo, there were probably no more than four vessels of the largest size operating on the Wabash at any given time. One of them, the steamer B.H. Hurt, was described in detail in the local press when it was commissioned. The Hurt was 123 feet long and 23 feet abeam and fitted out to accommodate passengers in the latest luxuries. The cabin was 68 feet long with 14 staterooms, including an office, a bar, and a pantry. Her boilers were 16 feet wide and 32 feet long. The cylinders were 9 feet and 1 half inch in diameter and 38 inches in stroke. There was even a bridal chamber, 13 feet long and 6 feet wide, with a Brussels carpet and chandeliers. The boat had a laundry, a cookhouse, water closets, and a complete crew that included a doctor. The plan route was two trips a week from Tyote to Vincennes and back with trips to Hudsonville on Saturdays. Another large steamer was the Crown Point, billed as the grandest boat on the river since the Romeo. She was 250 feet long, or 250 tons, I'm sorry, 125 feet long and 24 feet abeam and had 12 large staterooms, an office, carpeting and skylights. A pair of boilers, 18 feet long and 38 inches in diameter, drove two cylinders with four feet of stroke and 10 inch bores, providing a power to a single stern wheel. After doing service on the Wabash for about five years, the Crown Point was sold to new owners who operated her on the Mississippi just south of Memphis. Aside from the Romeo and the Crown Point uh, and the BH Hurt, the other steam, steamer, uh, the largest size on the Wabash River, was probably the Rosedale, built by the Hudnut Company in 1889. Details are lacking, but it's tonnage suggests that its, its length, arrangements, and engines must have been on par with these other three. Hudnut Homedy was a large corporation that produced a number of corn products, already an established company when it relo relocated its central operations to Terre Haute in 1866. Hudnet owned mills in several places across the country, including upriver from Terre Haute and Park County. The Wabash River trade, the Wabash River trade provided Hudnet with ways of receiving its corn supply. Farmers made use of the rich soil along the river bottoms to grow corn, and their proximity to the river bank made it convenient to ship it to the mill by steamer. Hudnet supplied seed to the farmers for free in exchange for an agreement to sell their crops to the mill and the extensive resources of a large company like Hudnut allowed it to build and maintain at least five steamers on the Wabash River between 1876 and 1903. The Crown Point, the Rosedale, the Irene, the Payanka Shaw, and the Belmont were all owned and operated by the Hudnuts. Newspaper reports suggest that there may have been other boats as well, but the details of those are somewhat sketchy. In 1889, the Army engineers reported 432,159 bushels of corn were transported by steamers on the Wabash River above Vincennes. That volume of corn was valued at well over $100,000, and it was enough to require dozens of trips by the largest of boats on the Wabash River, which in that year would have been the Rosedale. Corn was the largest cargo by volume, but not by value. The most valuable cargo was a half a million linear feet of lumber worth nearly three quarters of a million dollars. The lumber was all was hauled by the Tindolfs and their partners in Vincennes who operated a number of businesses, including a lumber mill. The Tindolfs were involved in more than one form of transportation and they also owned an interurban line, but they owned at least, they owned and operated at least four steamers in, on the Wabash between 1867 and 1883. The Belgrade, the Bell of Fontaine, Fountain, I'm sorry, the Bell Fountain, the Advance, and the Advance II. The ships were often described in newspapers as hauling lumber for the Tindolf Company and probably accounted for most of the uh, three quarters of a million dollars worth of wood in 1889. The engineer's report of 1889 actually included a letter from Alan Tendoff, one of the owners, praising the, the engineer's work and hoping that they would keep it up and keep the river navigable. 1889 actually saw a bumper crop for corn and other agricultural goods too, 
but according to the engineers, the Wabash River steamers made money even when they had substantially less corn to haul in a given year. And part of that money was from passengers, and part of it was from general haulage. Both the Hudnut and Tindall steamers were available for general hire for any purpose. Hudnut traffic in corn was obviously limited to a certain time of year, and then the rest of the year, the Rosedale and other steamers would be rented out or would be advertised as, moving, as uh, uh, transporting passengers. So in 1885, the Terre Haute newspapers carried a regular advertisement from the Rosedale, which left every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 10 a.m. for uh, Hudsonville. Similar advertisements were made by Tindoffs for the Bell of Fountain in 1883, and you can see advertisements for other boats in the same era, like the Reindeer in 1880 and the Cornelia in 1884, which made a run to Montezuma, Indiana, from a wharf at the foot of Cherry Street in Terre Haute on Wednesday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings. Passenger, passenger fare on the Cornelia was 45 cents to Clinton, 70 cents to Montezuma. One of the most common uses for river steamers was transporting excursions outings for church groups, social clubs, and company employee picket, picnics. The Rosedale was hired for at least a half a dozen excursions in the summer of 1886. The Bella Fountain, Fountain ran something like 15 excursions in 1883. The Army engineers estimated passenger income at a dollar per person, although information about excursions in the newspapers suggests the fare could be much higher, as much as $2 a head. And it was not unusual for an excursion to fully pack a steamer. So if you recall a minute ago, I mentioned that the Romeo once transported 700 people on a church picnic downriver. So 700 people at two bucks a head, not a bad deal. The income from the steamer business had to be weighed against cost, of course. Coal was required to fuel the boat engines. A crew was required to operate it. But the most expensive item was the boat itself and the most disastrous cost would be the loss. Fortunately, wrecks were, although occasionally reported along the Wabash River in the 19th century, do not, to, do not appear to have been very serious. The relatively shallow river made snags and other impediments a constant danger, but it also meant that the boat that sank could be easily recovered. Early in the 19th century, during the fevered height of the steamboat era, Horrible accidents and explosions were frequent on the Mississippi and Ohio, but after the war on the quieter waters of the Wabash, accidents were far less catastrophic. Although boats sometimes burned or collided with river obstructions or encountered flooding and ice, they apparently did so without loss of life. Serious accidents were rare, and even when one occurred, the loss was confined to property alone. When the Ida Lee sank in November of 1885, for example, all the passengers and the crew escaped harm. The boat was not recoverable because of the depth of the water and the strength of the current where it sunk, but there were many examples of far less severe rack, wrecks. In August of 1883, the Bella Fountain struck a snag and sank while in the middle, middle of the channel in eight feet of water. But the boat was raised in a day and the cargo was unharmed. The Belgrade stuck a uh, struck a snag and sank when 1,449 sacks of corn on board in June of 1884. But the lower deck of the boat was only under about six inches of water, and the newspaper estimated damage at about $500. And they predicted that the boat would be raised and returned to port within a couple of days. But even if a cargo, even if the cargo of a steamer suffered water damage from a wreck, there was still a chance of recovering some profit. The captain of the advance advertised the corn that was on board his ship after a wreck um, where it sank underwater for sale in the newspaper in 1867, obviously expecting someone to pay money for the corn even if it had been underwater for a while. And the newspapers in Covington, Indiana frequently advertised items that had been wabashed for sale, or in other words, things that had fallen into the river. The frequency of wrecks with such low stakes and the reports of them in the newspaper prompted a bit of parody in the press about the dangers of the river trade. So in 1872, the Terre Haute Weekly Express published a romance of the deep and dark blue Wabash River in which the steamer Lark springs a leak while on the Wabash 
and goes down in eight inches of water. Despite jettisoning a thousand bales of precious East Indian silk consigned to a merchant prince of Darwin. Tongue in cheek, the Express recounted how the captain rescued the crew and passengers by taking one under one arm and one under the other and making for a desert island in the river that was filled with cannibals and, and greedy Democrats. <laughs> Although the Lark was actually an actual Wabash River steamer owned by the uh, Tindolf family, the story in the Express was meant to be satire, poking fun at greedy Democrats, obviously, but also possibly at Spencer Bell, owner of the rival Terrell Gazette, who had written an uh, editorial in support of Greeley. Bell, Ball, Spencer Ball, I'm sorry, not Bell, Spencer Ball. Ball had editorialized about Greeley's nomination, Greeley's nomination in 1872 by accusing, the, by accusing the Express, who wrote this article, of keeping Republican readers in the dark. But in the Lark story, the captain of the sunken vessel captured one of these strange Greeley creatures on the island and tamed him and made him his man Wednesday and was said to be planning to return to the island armed with artillery and vaccines to see if he could not convert the rest of the barbarians. The vaccine remark being another dig at local politics in the small packs era. The humor of the piece may have been political, but it was unquestionably built around a familiar kind of newspaper story concerning the Wabash River boat trail. In a way, the Terrell Press represented a sort of second arm of the river business. The newspapers supplied a lot of river-focused information. There were columns devoted to river news, reporters devoted to gathering information about the latest happenings on the Wabash, and even a newspaper established solely in order to promote, in order to promote their business. If the Wabash River was sometimes left out of the books written by newspaper men, it definitely received lots of information in the newspapers themselves. For example, in 1882, 13-year-old Edward Price Bell walked into the office of the Terrell Weekly Gazette and asked the editor, Spencer Ball, for a job as a reporter. Although Ball couldn't resist chuckling at the boys fresh from the country suit, he gave Bell a job and taught him everything he needed to know about journalism, including spelling, according to Bell. Bell would go on to be a famous reporter for the Chicago Daily News and in London, and actually a nominee for the Nobel Peace Prize. But before all that happened, Spencer Ball assigned him to write stories about the Wabash River. The Daily Gazette and its companion papers, the Weekly Gazette and the Evening Gazette, were always interested in river news and began printing a semi-regular section on river news as early as 1870, just two years after the paper was established. The material often appeared under a separate headline of the river or river news or the Wabash and covered the comings and goings of the various steamers on the Wabash, as well as the state of the river in general, reports on the various people living and working on it, and opinions of old river veterans on flood stages, weather, and shipping costs. In May of 1881, when the Army Corps of Engineers uh, ongoing maintenance project was split into two parts, uh, a snag boat owned by the engineers called the Quasine came to Terre Haute, and the Gazette ran a story on its arrival, providing all the technical details of the boat. It was 125 feet long, it was 24 feet of beam, and it drew four feet of water, which was a lot for the Wabash, as the engineers would soon find out. Uh, the uh, newspaper even had a roving reporter, reporter on one snag boat, one a captain, um, one Edward Friend, who was also a riverboat captain, provided, li provided lively copy from the deck of the Petersburg um, as it went about its trade of clearing the river. Um, unfortunately, uh, Friend's reports were probably not what the newspaper was hoping for. There were only two that were sent back. The first one explained how the boat uh, ran aground on the first day, just off of town, and the second one uh, described an attempt to rescue some people who had fallen off another boat, but it was not successful. But, but still, river commerce and the newspaper came together in the most literal of ways in 1886, when the Hudgut Company of Terrell began publishing its own newspaper devoted to river news and known as the Rosedale Herald, which I might pause to say shouldn't be confused with the actual newspaper from the town of Rosedale, which is a, sounds the same name, but it's a different thing. 
Uh, the Rosedale Herald was written strictly to advertise the steamboat, the Rosedale, but it also included lots of river news in order to fill out its pages. It started off as a semi-weekly semi publication before switching to weekly, but it seemed to be fairly short-lived. Uh, the Hudnut Company continued to advertise the boat, the Rosedale, and the Terre Haute Gazette. At the same time, it was printing the Rosedale Herald newspaper of its own. It may have decided that the cost was not worth the effort, or the effort was not worth the cost. Um, unfortunately, I have not been able to actually find any copies of the Rosedale Herald, the steamboat newspaper. I'm sure it would be interesting reading. Okay, I would like to get to towards my end here by talking another about another interesting and important river person. So we started off with Chauncey, uh, excuse me, with Uriah Shoemaker. We're going to end up with uh, someone else, Commodore Chauncey Twaddle. So Commodore Twa Chauncey Twaddle is definitely a river man. He came to Terre Haute when he was a young boy or a boy, and he built and piloted flatboats in the 1830s. His knowledge of the Wabash River was encyclopedic, and as an adult. He built several boats and he floated them down the river, often with groups of friends who used them as an expedition to go hunting and fishing. Most of those boats were not powered. They involved uh, oars and sails and floated downstream. Many of them were towed back at the end of the trip and then taken apart and sold for lumber. But one boat that, that uh, Commodore Twaddle built was more, more ambitious. Uh, this boat was called the Diana. It was equipped with a steam engine and a stern wheel and with 75 tons, at least according to the Army Corps of Engineers. Commodore Twaddle and his friends made good use of the Diana for their river excursions, excuse me, but they also rented the Diana out for more commercial purposes. Eventually, they sold it to another group who used the boat for much the same thing. Now, Commodore Twaddle was a well-known figure in Tarot, and he got mentioned frequently in the newspapers, but we know a lot more about his river activities and the Diana because he kept the journal, which still exists today. And we can read about who went with them, what the various boats he built were like, and where they went and when. We can see uh, how much fish or game they caught, who got sick and had to go home, and maybe best of all, what the other steamers on the river, they, what other steamers on the river they saw when they were traveling along. Uh, Chauncey Twaddle, like Uriah Shoemaker, and a host of other Tarot River people reflected a serious commerce in the river business and gave left behind a record that's very interesting. So we can see, for example, in 1879, uh, Chauncey Twaddle encountered the reindeer and the Belgrade on his river trips, and he encountered the reindeer again in 1880. Uh, we can also see that he rented out the Diana to the Tindolf Company in 1887 and 1888 to help them haul lumber. And then in 1888, he passed away, and the Diana was sold uh, shortly thereafter for $1,000. When we read Chauncey's uh, diary of the river activities, we can see that uh, often what happened on the river trips was a lot of guys hunting and fishing and having a good time, but sometimes what happened was serious river business. And when, in, when boilers broke, or the rudder broke, or they ran into trees, snags, and other interesting river activities. Uh, I, I want to point out, for our, I think it's on a previous slide, if you're really into Chauncey Twaddle's uh, diary, it is in fact online. It's been scanned by the Sullivan County Public Library. You can go out and read it for yourself. It's uh, really interesting stuff to read. Uh, you can figure out how many ducks and snipe and uh, fish they got in any given day, and you can work out where they are. And he does explain every step of the way where they, where they go over and over again. It's really an interesting thing. And in fact, just to round up, I just want to, to wind up to say that the river connects to the tarot community in many, many ways. And we see uh, the comments made about the Wabash River by lots and lots of people. So I'm just going to put one last person on the page here, on the screen. And this is uh, someone we all know, Theodore Dresser. Uh, Theodore Dresser, uh, the quote is, I remember once being on the Wabash River with my brother Rome in a small boat. The yellow water seemed more of a wonder and a terror to me than it does today. This is when Dresser came back to Tarot as a grown man after 20 years of living in New York. If you've ever read his book, uh, Hoosier Holiday. It's a, I recommend it. It's a great book. It's a, one of the first car trip books ever written. He and his friend, an uh, artist, came uh, from New York 
to Indiana to visit their hometowns. And when they came to Wabash, or came to Terre Haute, his artist friend was sketching all along the way. The pictures are in the book. This is the picture that they included. This is a picture of the Wabash River from the West Terre Haute side. Sketch at dusk by Dresser's artist friend as a capture of the city and the way he saw it in 1915. So the river and the uh, famous Terrell residents are always deeply connected. And finally, to, to end, I love this quote from, uh, from the 80s. Uh, See, it always comes back to that river. It ever has, it always has. It has ever since, I'm sorry, the beginning of time. So that's it, thank you. So oh, I assume I, I'm happy to answer questions if someone has any. I may have trouble hearing you, but so I'll yell out. <laughs> Go ahead. How were the steamships maintained? Were there places along the Wabash that would uh, assist in the uh, mechanics of the upkeep? Yes. There, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's so that you could really see it in, in Twaddle's diary because they'll stop at these places. A lot of them look like they they were maybe more like farms or sort of private places, but they knew they could stop and there would be things that they could use to help fix the boat or resupply the boat. But I don't have a lot of detail. I know they're there, but I haven't got very much of it. In the towns, like Hudsonville and places, there was always some, some place where they could go. But I think there were probably more too. Yeah. I noticed you didn't mention the slaves in that list on the corn and all that. I mean, it was 154,000. Yes, but I'm after the Civil War, so there aren't, uh, yeah. But yes, you're correct. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Keep going. Was, were these boats a major source of transportation for getting them to one place? You know, they may have been on the, on the Mississippi, yes. On the Mississippi and Ohio, most definitely, yes. Uh, not, not to my knowledge on the Wabash. I will say this though, it seems to be fairly clear that a lot of these Wabash steamers after the Civil War had crews made up possibly of former slaves. Uh, there's, there's not much ever said about them, but there is one article on the paper uh, about a disruption on the river uh, with a, bunch, a crew of a riverboat. And it was clear from that discussion that they had come from the South and it was an all black crew of some sort. So. Whoever wants to go and ask them back. Do you think if uh, the river had been maintained as being navigable by Andrew Jackson, a different, would it have significantly changed Terre Haute? Would it have grown as a yeah, city? It, yeah, it's a complicated question, but I think, yeah, I think there's probably. So uh, the story I didn't tell tonight that I'm trying to tell is after this era, the city starts to think of the river in the way that we think of it now as more of a leisure place. Uh, and there's a transformation with uh, Fairbanks Park and uh, 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 really a big transformation in the sort of the structure of, of Terre Haute along the river bank. And all of that came, I think, uh, because the commercial nature of it was probably not what it had once been. So if they had kept the commercial uh, steam traffic up, that, that may have really affected that. Because you have as a you know, the businesses like Crawford Fairbanks donates a big chunk of land for the park because it's no longer a viable sort of promote. And his distillery there and those things were no longer, it was no longer important to have them sitting on the river like that had been. So, yeah. Did the railroad begin to replace? Yeah, they're, at the same time, it's an really interesting thing. So uh, they are, they're predate this by quite a bit. And if you notice uh, early on, I mentioned that the reason Voorhees lobbied for more money on the northern part of the Wabash was because of support from William Riley McKean. And I don't know who, if everyone knows who he is, but he's the owner of the, the Terre Haute Railroad. Or the, he's the guy that's the president of the Terre Haute Railroad. So this is the railroad president saying, oh yeah, please work on the river. So there's, I think they have different functions, right? So the river has a niche, uh, hauling corn up and down from farmers is more efficient on the river, but the railroad uh, has a different sort of function and travels in different directions. I'm not an railroad expert. Other people know better, but I would say probably doesn't really follow the, the river route as much as, you know, due east and west 
and north and south instead of along the river. So, so they compete. They definitely compete, but they're not. It's not that the railroad stamped it out, you know, because it was still operating with the railroads. Oh, and one in the back, and then I get you, Jack. After boats had sunk, how would they be recovered from the river? Uh, you know, I don't know the answer to that. There are some um, comments in different places about that. Uh, and uh, the Chauncey Twaddle's journal mentions going out to try to get some wrecks. Uh, but I don't have an exact count. The only way I can find out is, is to pour through all the newspapers and try to tally something up, and I haven't done that. So I, I don't know the answer to that. Seems like most of them were, but not all of them for sure. So. Agenda. Who funded the Erie Wabash Canal? Oh, that's a good question. We need canal experts in the world because uh, it's the state, right? Mostly, I think, is my and private investors probably, uh, but I think it's not. It's not federal, to my knowledge. No, yeah, and so the state was pouring their money into the canal, not the river, uh, up until, you know, after the Civil War, the canal is pretty much a goner. I mean, there's pieces still there, but it's not, and so that's the point at which. People start thinking about the river again, uh, uh, but it's go ahead. Sorry. Uh, the large amount of lumber that was being carried, where was it coming from, and where was it headed? Well, I think it was mostly cut along the river banks. Uh, they were, and again, I'm already out of my depth, but uh, they were a large. You know, there was a heavily forested area south of, on the on the river. Uh, I think they were cutting down trees close to the bank or not far from the bank. And then it was taken to uh, lumber mill, sawmills in Vincennes or Terre Haute and cut into board. And then I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't shipped by rail to some other places, but it was the proximity to the river of the trees that probably did it. To answer your question, they uh, financed the canal. The federal government did in a way because they gave, they, there was land in Beagle County that was donated to the state of Indiana to sell as canal land. And it was not along the canal. The same way the river. You go down to Prairie Creek, and there's land in the river bottoms down there. You'll find on maps, it'll say canal land. The canal land, the canal went nowhere near to Prairie Creek. Interesting. But, they, but the federal government gave it to them to sell, to make money to build okay. the canal. The bad part was, is everybody knew that at that point in time in history, that land was going to go under water, and who wanted to buy it? I had another interpretation of that. I was under the, uh, the understanding that a lot of times the state went after they went bankrupt, gave people land in place of paying because they didn't have money. Yeah, I, I know that the state did go bankrupt, but I don't know about that. But I don't know if you know. Uh, yeah, the state went bankrupt. This, they borrowed money from mainly a lot of people in New York City and London. Mm -hmm. And of course, there was a big thing about that. But the state could, there was no way. From Terre Haute South, the canal was a big failure. From Terre Haute North, it was maybe okay. But from Terre Haute South, they had too many problems. If you saw his map, it looked at Terre Haute, it left the Wabash yeah. and cut. And that's actually called the Crosscut Canal. And it went to, <clears throat> now today we would say Worthington, but at that point in history, it was called Point Commerce. And uh, <clears throat> and there was actually going to be another canal cut off up there around Peru and come down through Indianapolis and join back up down there with, with that canal at Worthington. So it was going to be a big intersection and, and all of that. But they couldn't keep it. The Canal in New York State was very successful and made lots of money. It was the only yeah. one that ever was. <laughs> and, and so everybody else thought they could jump. Yeah, it's like a great and idea. And, yeah. And, and it turned out. Was fun all right. And I will point out, just as interesting to me, as I read, read the congressional record and to look for things about the Wabash, how often you have guys saying, we need to build a canal from like Michigan to the Ohio River. I mean, and this is 1890, you know, in 1895, there's still people going, hey, the federal government needs to give us money to build a canal. I mean, but clearly a canal business is gone, but it's never you know, ever forgotten as a project. The river and the canal both had a problem that made the railroads look good. When they freeze over in the winter, you can't do anything. <laughs> yeah. True. So the railroads can run in winter. Yeah. 
Yeah, they were going to win. There was just no doubt about it. And they could, you could lay a track pretty much wherever you wanted to go. You didn't have to just follow the water. So, but, but I thought it was interesting that they did coexist a lot. You know, usually you think, well, steamboats are gone. We have a railroad, but they were they were running at the same time. So. Oh, good. When is your book coming out, and is it on? <laughs> a long time. I have got two chapters done out of five, so you're going to have a year or so, probably before that uh, gets done, at least. But. Uh. And they recovered any of the old sunken steams? Now, say that again, I'm sorry. Have they recovered any of the old sunken steams? I don't know. I've heard rumor to this effect. I don't know this for. Uh, somebody told me they'd heard that something had been recovered, but I don't know about it myself. So uh, I'm sure there's got to be stuff out there. Uh, and, you know, with today's technology, I haven't had a lot to find it easier. But, but uh, to my knowledge, no one's really seriously looking to see. Uh, we're trying to plot out. I think if you took all this stuff, put it on a map, you'd be able to start to work out where things might be and then start doing a little treasure hunting. But I don't know anybody. What was the uh, logic with building the canals? Was it simply that the Erie Canal was profitable yeah. to mimic it, or was it it's easier to maintain, so let's build that and replace the river maintenance? Well, I think the first is the logic. I think uh, the, the fact that it actually does overlap the river so much, I don't see that anybody overtly saying that. I didn't really strike me until I saw this map one day and thought, you know what, this is really just the river. Right, but uh, but let's make it better, and I will control the uh, water level. And we'll turn at there. I already go straight to Evansville instead of following that wandering line, right? Uh, but I think that really the big logic is, as uh, other people have said, was that the Erie Canal works well. We can get in on that. We, we can extend that traffic through our our state, you know, and uh, build up our industry as a result of it. But, Well, thanks everybody for coming out on a Monday night before Thanksgiving. I appreciate it.